This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And I think today, Randall, we're going to be talking about Lake Bonneville. Is that where we're going? Bonneville floods? Yeah, I thought we'd take a dip into Lake Bonneville. All right, good. Well, Bradley, how are you doing this week, sir? Hey, I'm a busy guy. Busy guy. Uh, Pretty worn out, but uh, you know, I noticed something today. Days are getting longer. It was still light out at 6.15, so that's positive. Yeah. I feel better about that. Yep. Hmm. I like the winter. I like the short. I like the long nights. The nighttime is the right time, That's right. Brad. That's right. <laughs> Worship the moon, not the sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't felt that way every year, but that's just something that hit me yesterday. Uh, okay. All right. Well, you're excused for that then. All right. As long as it's not all the time. Mike. COVID doing, free. Sir? Hanging in and COVID free. All right. Good. So you got your... Your Cosmo shirt. Brad's got his Cosmo shirt. I've got my Cosmo shirt. Kyle's got his Cosmo shirt. Randall! <laughs> Outcast. Mine's in the laundry. Okay. See, here's At least the problem. You wash I it. wear three extra large, so, like, we don't have that many of them. So, I get one yeah. at a time. Right. Okay. Well, so, I least... wear it for, you know, three or four weeks, and then I put it in the laundry. <laughs> So we were just about to give you props for washing it. Another. <laughs> I need a backup. I do. I, I seriously need a backup t-shirt. That way I can just switch back and forth and always have one on. Yeah. Well, I got the white one now and the black one. So it's kind of a backup. Yeah, it is kind of a backup, isn't it? Yeah. Look at you guys. Well, you know what? It, it might be out. Uh, yeah. If Julie has done the laundry today, it could be uh, in the clean clothes pile. So on the break. I'll go check that Maybe out. Maybe swipe it out right, of there, we'll, yeah. We'll pause. We'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> we got well, new ones on the way, too. I hope everybody gets one. But uh, George offered uh, during the Egypt episode that he had some special ma- special ones made up and printed with the dates of the tour out there when they were in Egypt. So uh, yeah, we'll be able to sport those, too. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then also hats, right? Are mm-hmm. those going on the on for sale? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yes. I saw I saw Rowan wearing one. It looks great. Yeah. Can't yeah. wait to yeah. get one of those. You need one too. Yeah, good looking. And then I can wear a Cosmo hat and a Brothers of the Serpent shirt. And I can, yeah. You know, I can switch it up, right? Yeah. We should get some Indiana Jones hats. And I can reduce there the glare. <laughs> and the, the logo specially designed on the hat right here actually focuses the cosmic rays onto your third eye chakra. On your third eye. All right. Yeah. That's... Excellent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Brain true, expansion so there's that, <laughs> that going on top that's, of looking cool. That's a plus. Yeah, yeah that is a plus. Yeah. No yeah. extra charge. <laughs> <laughs> no extra charge for cosmic enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> we throw that in free. So that's right. <sighs> Doing what we can. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that image you have behind you there, Randall? Ah, that? that is Massacre Rocks. There was a big battle the fought there. He uh, has shown us that one before, actually. And in what state is Massacre Rocks located? It's in the state of Idaho, Mike. It's in Idaho. Southern Idaho, right along the Snake River Plain. And we're going to take a little tour, Mike. We're going to start in Utah in the basin of Lake Bonneville, and we will travel north through the Marsh Valley, through the Portness Valley, we shall exit the valley at Pocatello, and we shall follow the winding pathway of the Snake River as it crosses the Snake River Plain. And we will follow it up through Hell's Canyon, and we'll stop at right there at the confluence of the Snake and the Clearwater Rivers. We have two cities there. We have um, Clarkston, Idaho. And Lewiston, no, back up, Lewiston, Idaho, Clarkston, Washington. Yep. Yeah. Well done, guys. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I think no you're rehearsal right. necessary. Yeah, no zero rehearsal. Brad's able to point to it on the map while Rand was talking. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, yeah, that's after years and years of being immersed. That's right. Snake River. That sounds like our kind of place. So I know. I'm looking yeah, forward. To Hell's it. Canyon. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell's Canyon. See, we were getting a little concerned there after a while, and that um, you know, so many of the places that we visit, you know, the Devil's Punch Bowl, right, right, the Devil's Playground, Hell's Canyon, <laughs> and the list goes on and on and on. So, just want to let everyone know: no, we are not Satanists. Not quite. Not quite. But I don't know. Maybe that's it's, um, it's it's more complicated than that. You know, it's more complicated than that. Yes. Well, you know, Meteor Crater used to be called Diablo Canyon. That's right. Really? Yeah, well, yeah. That's right. They thought, it, they right they thought it was a canyon. Well, there's a Diablo Canyon is is nearby, so it's oh okay. Yeah. Well, how they identified it. You know what? It's interesting. We'll get into some of the symbol when we get into symbolism. We'll look at the the demonic symbols a little bit. Don't everybody get scared away. We're just looking at them as archetypal symbols for various forces in nature, if you will. But the devil has symbolism, just like Set in the Egyptian pantheon has symbolism. And that symbolism can be associated with specific forces in nature. Likewise, Christian symbolism can. Once you get away from the uh, the superstition dimension of the religion and get into the scientific basis behind all symbolism and understand that the symbolism of there, uh, there is the same as the symbolism everywhere else that, um, yeah, that you can begin to penetrate that layer and try to discern the actual meaning that's underlying it. That's why we showed the tarot card and I showed the representation of the angel with the, um, with the, uh, the torch, Fire the blazing torch. torch. Yeah, and the, the blazing of water, torch right? and the the urn of water representing the, the, the bimodal destruction of the earth by uh, by the forces of fire and by the forces of water. And just about all mythology from all over the world that gets into these eschatological myths will invoke almost invariably fire or water is the agency of that destruction. So behind me here, what we see is the agency of water on a huge scale. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And we have been talking about this for uh, many episodes now. Yeah. Um, because one of my purposes in doing this to this level is to try to dispel any doubt in people's minds that these kinds of tremendous hydrological events have actually taken place. And so far, we're focusing on the North American continent, but what we're finding out is that, you know, these these mega floods seem to be pretty much everywhere you look, you see the evidence of mega floods, which, you know, raises some very interesting questions. Now, I'm not saying that all of the things we've been looking at are all the same event, but I'm also not saying that they're not the same event. I don't think at this point that they are the same event, but I think what we could say is that they're part of a series of events that are all interlinked. You know, that it's that we're looking at the phenomena of the planet trans transitioning between one mode and another mode. And when it's going through those modal changes, if you will, that's when all of the action takes place. That's when, uh, when change is compressed into orders of magnitude uh, rates beyond the normal rate. Um, so it's this kind of a, you know, you would say it's a sawtooth graph if you look at it that way. And uh, I think maybe one of the possible interpretations of this is that in between the sawtooths, when you have these spells of relatively calm in between the, the, the catastrophes, that's when civilizations arise. And when you run into the, the peaks and the sawtooth, that's when civilizations fall and disappear from the record. But see, one of the three, another reason I've belabored this so much is to really make it clear why 
evidence of former cultural activities would be, you would not expect to find any um, widespread evidence. Because, you know, look at behind me here. We're looking at an evidence. We're looking at an event that basically stripped away 400 feet of actual bedrock. And see this pile of stuff behind me here? That's basically rubble that prior to this flood, through, prior to this hydrological event that swept through and across the Snake River Plain of southern Idaho, this was all part of the bedrock that you see behind me here, this basalt bedrock. And that Which, bedrock could have had like, you know, 10 feet of soil on top of it too, probably, right? Ooh. Forests, who knows? Well, we're going to see that when we get into the scablands, when we start looking at the rolling Palouse areas, 200 feet of soil. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah 200 feet of soil stripped away. And then wow. another four, five, six, seven hundred 700 feet of bedrock. Wow. So these are forces that are almost inconceivable in their power and their violence. And the vast majority of human race, even the scientists, are unaware of the scale. This is changing. This is changing. But certainly what I've learned, having studied this stuff for 40 years now, is that the number of researchers and scientists and, and, and uh, people that are studying this kind of stuff, probably not more than a dozen people have really, I think, in my opinion, based upon you know, an immersive study of all of the literature on all of this stuff that we've been talking about is that what is now missing is the, the linkage, the connections, the network of linkage that ties all this stuff together. And it's only now that, that, that geologists and scientists and researchers are beginning to make those connections. So, uh, where it's going to lead, I don't know, but it certainly does open up the door to, the recognition that these events, let me put it this way. If an event like the Younger Dryas happened now, you would be hard pressed to find any evidence that we were here with our civilization. If you're looking back from 10,000 years in the future. See, so that's the perspective you have to, to look at this thing in. And once you do that, you'll begin to, okay, now it's beginning to make sense to me. Why, even if there was something more advanced than the, the conventional models of prehistory would have us believe. Well, even if there was, we would really, what trace of it would we expect to find? Even if it was a very materialistically based culture like our own. Because we don't know that it was necessarily utilizing the same technologies that we are using or that it would look, see anything. See, the thing is, if you're projecting into the past and, and trying to determine whether or not there was advanced civilization that existed in the past. Well, you know, you're going to be already restricted in your interpretations. If you're looking through a lens, strictly expecting to see some reflection of our own, of our own society, of our own civilization, it might not look anything like what we've done, what we've created here in the last three to 500 years. Inspired, you know, inspired by the, reignition of learning that came with the with the um, you know the rise of western civilization and the classics the rediscovering of the classics the greek and the roman their ideas of civilization how those were transplanted preserved through the middle ages how the arabs took that took the works of architecture and mathematics and astronomy from the greeks preserved it and through that venue came back to europe to inspire the the gothic the high Gothic period of seven, 800 years ago, and essentially led, opened the door to the Renaissance, which then opened the door to the industry, to the scientific enlightenment, which opened the door to the industrial revolution that led to where we are now. So we don't know that a prehistoric civilization would have followed that same route. And in fact, it probably wouldn't. It could take a completely different form. And so if we're looking for a reflection of ourselves, we might miss, we might miss the signifiers that could give us some idea of what an ancient civilization might've looked like, but we can certainly draw a few conclusions because of the things, look, all the things we talk about, you know, in terms of 
you know, the pyramids of Egypt. You know, to me, are, are, it's like this is such a salient, out there, in your face example of something that's just out of complete, completely out of context for how we envision the beginnings of modern civilization, right? And you can spin scenarios and say, oh, well, no, they could have accomplished this, you know, uh, however many tens of thousands of workers had to work for how long to accomplish it. But again, we're looking at the supposition that a mere generation or two preceding this, all of Egypt was basically, you know, farmers, subsistence farmers in the Nile Valley. So, you know, again, like, but hey, like our good friend Graham Hancock points out, you know, years ago, that it's in some ways it almost seems like the beginning of our own civilization was the end of something else. And I also think that once we understand the Younger Dryas and we understand the the, the massive fluctuations um, that occurred in climate and environment in that roughly 3,000 year transition out from the say 14.5 date when the first big melt wave of melting started through the Younger Dryas boundary, through the conclusion of the Younger Dryas. In all of that, you know, what we're essentially, it's still now 10,000 years later, 11,000 years later, I think still reeling somewhat from the aftershocks of those events. And I think we can see them playing out throughout the Holocene. I mean, um, when you look at the changes that have occurred just through the Holocene, I think that we could perhaps attribute some of those changes, periods of seismicity, periods of volcanism particularly, um, to being the aftershocks of the transition. Because, hey, we know that isostatic adjustment is still taking place. You know, it's still taking place. Can the region around Hudson Bay is still rising. You know, just Lake Bonneville alone created isostatic depressions and is still rising, although very slowly now. But, but you know, my point is is that I keep emphasizing this over and over again. If there was if there was a river flowing in the pre-flood Snake River plain behind me, and there was communities, there was villages, there were towns, anything along that river, well, that's gone. That's that's the rubble that's behind me there. See, that rubble that's behind me literally is the wreckage of whatever world was there before that flood came through. That's wreckage, see? So why don't we go from there into talking about some of this uh, things that happened. We've, we've been going across the uh, around... Uh, regions of North America, we're just, you know, kind of following a route, but at the same time, we're also doing some leapfrogging around. Um, we have looked um, at the great, the big tunnel valleys up there, uh, you know, in, in Manitoba and Ontario. We looked at those up there by Lake Hind. We've looked at uh, the area around the Finger Lakes. We've looked at boulder fields in Pennsylvania. We've looked at, um, uh, you know, in Wisconsin, the, the, the overflow of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, the spillway through Devil's Lake, uh, the mega flood that came down the Wisconsin River, created the Wisconsin Dells. We've looked at the St. Croix River, which issued from uh, the Lake Superior Lobe and the catastrophic floods that came down through there. It created the huge potholes at, at St. Croix Falls. We've looked at... Um, the James, I mean, not the James, the, uh, the, uh, post the, the, uh, the flood from Lake Agassiz that created, um, yeah, the James river, um, that the, that carved the valley that the Minnesota river now flows in. Um, we've looked at, uh, the Southeast. We've looked at these massive boulder fields. And of course we've only scratched the surface of any of this. That's, that's the thing you got to keep in mind as well. I mean, we looked at what, uh, uh, possibly 10 or 12, uh, different Creek valleys. Well, you could go, there's hundreds all throughout the Southern Appalachians where you find these massive deposits of, of boulders, you know, 18, 20, 100, up to 20, 200, 300, 400 ton boulders mantling 
the stream hollows that are were not in place by anything even remotely like the discharge capacity of the modern creeks, even in their peak floods. So we've looked at all of that. So we've covered a lot of territory, but really we're only getting started. That's the thing. We uh, So we're moving west now, and I think what we'll do is I think I'll pull up um, I'll pull up the national map that we like to look at so much. And, and while you're doing that, I just want to say, there are, people will remember we had Ben from Uncharted X and George on, uh, and they showed us, or Ben showed us a bunch of his footage from Egypt. And of course, that's showing us, you know, uh, elements of something lost or forgotten. Some, you know, when, when especially that part where he's there under the, the pyramid and they look down there's this deep shaft and down at the bottom there's this enormous granite box that's been constructed and you know there's something yeah strange about that and so kyle and i have had been on well we've been doing a series of shows like that with ben and i just want to say that like the last one we did was looking at stuff that he in peru and you can just tell that the people who built those megalithic walls down there they just they were completely different and they're thinking mm-hmm, than we are mm-hmm, today. The you mm-hmm. know that this just you just see the construction. You're like, okay, whoever built that had they were nothing like us in terms of how we build stuff and how we think about building things. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, when you were talking about you know like expecting to see a culture like ours, well, and you're absolutely right. And we have evidence of it in some cases, in some places where it survived, like in Egypt. You know, which may have been a protected mm-hmm. area, like some of these places up in the Andes in Peru, which may have been a protected area. There are remnants of civilizations that built things on scales and with styles that just make almost no sense. We can't, you can't really comprehend it. It's, mm-hmm. it's haunting was the word that we came up with in, in, uh, in the show we were doing with Ben. You look at it and you're like, who did this? And why did they do it that way? It's so, uh, I know. mysterious. It's, it's, yeah. you know, for me, it's almost like, uh, yeah, it's just almost pathologically curious. Yes. That's about right. <laughs> what is the story here? That's right. And God, I would like to know that story. Yeah, and profoundly right. beautiful at the same time. It's yes. Just, God, they it, were masters of their art and, so and, and just, ah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's certainly something. That's that showed itself right there. That's present right at the dawn of what we think of as modern civilization. Yeah. And it's out of context. And I don't care how the academics try to dismiss it or, you know, explain it away or ignore it. It's there. It's just, yeah. I mean, it's like, Hey, we can ignore what's behind me here or we can go, wait a second. There's something, there's a much larger story here. Yeah, I mean, there's look, there's a field of rubble out there, but so what? Yeah. Well, when you literally begin to understand that that field of rubble was not so long ago part of a now non-existent world that was destroyed in an episode of almost unimaginable power, force, and violence. Yeah, obviously there's something else going on here that it might behoove us to try to figure out. Because see, we've been lulled into this complacency by the by the comforting nostrums of gradualism and uniformitarianism. Yes, everything only ch- happens, changes, you know, one grain of sand and one drop of water at a time. And at that rate, hey, there's nothing to worry about. There's no larger forces that we even have to concern ourselves with. Well, yeah, I mean, now and then there may be a, you know a tornado, a hurricane, an earthquake, a volcanic eruption. But these are essentially strictly local or regional events. And they don't affect the larger stability of the planet as a whole. But uh, that comforting paradigm is rapidly going by the wayside. Rapidly. And like you said before, we're barely scratching the surface. You know, we joked about that as a little, you know, toying we were going to do as our as our signal at the end of the shows but uh you know there's so much more that we can get into depending on just the time that we can spend with this podcast and 
and even just the flooding evidence that we're talking about. Like Randall said, we've jumped around the country. We've missed so many places, but we're we're really gearing to get to the scab lands because we've got our, our trip coming up in May and we want to cover some of that ahead of time and, and in depth. But, you know, we've skipped over the Ohio River and the, you know, canyons out into the, uh, the continental shelf and the Hudson River Valley and the, you know, current ripples through the Mojave Desert and all around Death Valley. You know, I mean, we've missed so many can, places yeah. that hopefully we're going to get back to. So like he said, we're, we're, we've presented a lot, but it's really Randall's just scratching the surface with all this. There's so much more evidence. The Kankakee Torrent. Oh, that, that was the first one that made me think, well, yeah, we haven't even gotten to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Through, yeah. through Illinois, right? But yeah, we've we've got some documentation of some really interesting geomorphology from the Kankakee Torrent, which was actually identified maybe even back as early as the 1920s and given the name to Kankakee Torrent. Um, so there's always been these mavericks that have looked at stuff and thought, this is kind of evidence of catastrophe on a considerable scale. But uh, yeah, and I love diving into that, some of that stuff. And of course, when we get into the scablands, we will talk about probably the most prominent of the catastrophists, if you will, of the 20th century, which would have been J. Harlan Bretz, particularly when he was like the only one, you know, in the 20s and the 30s. Not really, but he was clearly the most prominent. And because of that, he was the primary target of the, uh, you know, the anti heretical clerics that were uh, self-appointed suppressors of, you know, gradualistic heresies. So, yeah, but if, if you want to read the story, the background of, um, of J. Harlan Bretz, it's a very interesting story. And, and Graham Hancock in the thing, uh, magicians of the gods gives a really readable account of the whole controversy yes. that surrounded Bretz and really, really kind of underscores what a hero he was to stick to his guns. Like he did in spite of the fact that he was being so, um, you know, uh, attacked by his, by his peers and so on. Let's, let's take the geographic overview here. I'm going to, I'll do a share screen. I would like uh, to say real quickly too, that sure. looking at all of this stuff through this lens that you've provided for all of us has, I mean, for me personally, it makes it so much more interesting and fascinating yep. than the standard story for, for whatever reason. Uh, but after having learned what I have from, from listening to you and, and uh, you know, looking into all this stuff, George Howard, uh, Graham Hancock, and then going to Murray Springs, seeing that, two inch thick black line through the sediment just had this huge yeah. impact on me. That's right. That never would have happened. I mean, it would have just, oh, that's just a line in the dirt. But the, uh -huh. you know, it was, it was the, it's like a revelation. Well, it, it is was amazing. Uh, and what's so amazing inspiring. about that is clearly nature has provided this line of demarcation. Yes. Literally between two different worlds. Worlds. And it's the veil, yeah. right? And it's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I, I wish that this would be part of academia because I feel like it would inspire people. You know, well, Kyle, it, it that does. is why we're going to build a school. All right. And this is not a mere pipe dream. In fact, I'm having lunch tomorrow with some potential investors that are looking at acreage in North Georgia, and they are very interested in the idea of a school, a university in the universal sense, a city of the universe, which is what a university city is, right? Yeah, there you go. All right. There we go. Well, you guys so. need a janitor? <laughs> yeah. We'll, I am we'll, a master of the custodial arts. <laughs> yeah, actually, we will need a, a, a custodian. Okay. The other thing is, too, is that it is, I'm, I'm an artist. I, I write and uh, I write lyrics. And that this whole story has inspired yes. a whole lot Countless. of yeah. lyrics and it's just still coming in these, you know, as I learn new mm. things and experience and, and trying to imagine this story, it's like this, this great untold story. And mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it's like, 
I don't know. It's just inspiring in so many different ways. I feel like, uh, yeah, one of the uh, slogans at the beginning of one of the books uh, written about the channel Scabland formation, um, the slogan is, um, it may be the greatest story yet untold. Yes. Yeah. And they're only looking at a piece of it. Right. They're only looking at a, at a piece of it. And still, the prominence and, and power and magnitude of the story is almost impossible to wrap your head around. And as we get into it deeper, you'll really begin to understand how this is. It is, it is the root stratum of all the great mythic archetypes of all the lands exactly. of the, of the world. Exactly. And it has come down to us through, through many forms, but ultimately behind it all, there's this reality, this existence that's behind that veil. Yeah. And that's what we're attempting to do here. We're attempting in our own humble way to part that veil a bit. Yeah. To part that veil and look at that world that existed before. And I think that as we get to, uh, you know, immerse ourselves more into the specifics of it, we'll begin to appreciate what a hell of a story it is. And I we mean, need the great artists of the world to also look at it so that they can rewrite the new iteration of that story. The new iteration you know, of that story, yes. Continue the the tradition. Yeah, it's it's funny in a way because the the conventional story really reduces it down and, and, and in no way demeaning the interest or significance of finding debitage, you know, on the floor and finding, yeah, here's, here's a Clovis spear point. That's exciting. It really is. Yeah. But the trick now, the, the challenge is how do you reconcile that Clovis spear point with the carving of the Sphinx or, you know, Gobekli Tepe or any of the other potential uh, paleolithic constructions that are yep. so out of context. There, there's a story there that we're only see, seeing in the in the dimmest outlines. We're only seeing pieces of the shadow of this story at this point. But I think what will happen is over the next decade or two, we're going to see more and more discoveries that are going to allow us to, to, to put some flesh upon these bones. And to assemble these bones, we're still in the process of collecting the bones, the dry bones from the valley and assembling those bones to see what kind of a creature they compose. And then the next step is to put the, the flesh and blood on those bones and see what this thing was. And that's where we're at at this point. And I want to live long enough to see it. I think we're, but, you know, I think nature has given us a kind of a time machine, a psychic time machine. And that's something else we've got to explore is uh, things are happening on that front with suddenly we're discovering that, uh, well, hey, guess what? Nature has provided through the agencies primarily of plants access to a sort of a time machine. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That allow us to go back and dialogue with landscapes in a way we'd never even thought was possible. And, 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 and assist us in, in deciphering those landscapes of, of by entering into that dialogue with the landscapes, the landscapes will then yield up their secrets. They'll yield up their story in a way that would be very difficult to access. But that seems to be part of nature's plan as well to provide us the tools. And, yep, you know, I've told that. the story before and I, I would definitely you know, attribute some of those early experiences in the late 60s and early 70s to an altered perception of the landscape assisted by using what nature had provided. But we'll get into that later on because there's some very interesting things developing on that front right now, including a laboratory that's going to the... be built in Georgia. Yeah, and probably just in our backyard, which we'll be talking about um, soon. Once it's a little further along, and once I know that I'm uh, got a green light to talk about it, which I'm sure it, I do. Um, but you know, there are details still yeah. being hashed out. But it could be the state of the art facility 
on planet Earth for the cultivation of psychic medicines from yes. the plant world. Understanding our relationship with those medicines too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Awesome. I was just going to say it's another version of when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, right? So it's going to be a teacher, though, that not really the kind that we would expect, though. It may be the plant kingdom that's that teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's something reaching out through the plant kingdom, possibly. I've seen that as the idea. Ah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. Nice. Awesome. All right. We're going to look at maps before we take a break. Yes, we will. All right. Okay, uh, go back here and I will do a quick screen share. All right, Russ, let me know when you see it. We see it. Good deal. Okay, so in the last couple of episodes, we've been focusing on this area right here, which is the Southern Appalachians. Uh, we're going to have to double back again at some point and revisit just about all of these areas. Come on there, come into focus. Yeah, there we go. Um, we're looking at here what I'm suggesting may have been a major conduit for catastrophic flows all down through who are the Valley and Ridge province, which is a series of sort of accordion-like folds in the bedrock due to compression. But we're going to leave that area. We're going to come across the Midwest and you'll notice that there's that there's terrain here, valleys and hills and so forth. But then you get to this area right here, this large flat area. Well, that's the Mississippi River Plain. And what we're seeing here is right here, Little Rock's right in here. And this is 100 miles wide, basically. And this was one of the largest conduits for meltwater flow to the Gulf of Mexico. The uh, This... Here, the flow that came through here that left this flat sedimentary plain behind and as an aftermath, it was being fed by the uh, catastrophic flows of the Wisconsin River that we looked at, the catastrophic flows of the um, St. Croix River that we looked at, the draining of Glacial Lake Agassiz that uh, created the, Mississippi, the Minnesota River Valley, also, which we haven't really looked at yet, uh, catastrophic flows feeding down through the Missouri River Valley. And they all converge north of here. And these combined tremendous flows uh, created a river, in this case, 100 miles wide. And then flowed down and in discharging into the Gulf, essentially created all of this delta land in here. That now New Orleans is, is upon this delta land that was deposited in the Gulf um, during the primarily during the last meltdown. Okay, so now we'll come across. Here's the uh, here's the Ozarks up here, and here um, is the Wachita Mountains or Wachita Mountains right here. We're not going to stay there. We're going to keep going west, and we're going to come on across to the Basin and Range Province, which will. Come in here. Let's back out. And here we go. Here's the Basin and Range Province in this area right in here. This great kind of circular area. Uh, and you'll notice why it's called Basin and Range, because there are basins and ranges. You have mountain ranges, and in between those ranges are a whole series of basins with flat floors. Those flat floors are because those were depositional environments in standing water. Now, the thing about the Basin and, Lake, uh, Basin and Range Province is it has no outlet to the ocean. So any rainfall or any accumulation of water within this does not flow to the ocean. Now, you can see here's Death Valley. Some of the water could flow into Death Valley. And in fact, we know that that did happen once because Lake Manly, in the recent geological past, occupied that Death Valley, which would be this right here, not, uh, if we take that off, uh, here we go, right here, Death Valley National Park. Lake Manley was nearly a 1,000 feet deep, 
and we're going to we're going to double back and we're going to talk about Lake Manly. But today we're going to primarily talk about um, Lake Bonneville. And um, let's see elevation. We'll do the tinted because in this this tilting here, it shows up real nice. The basin and range province. Come on down. So while we're on this part of the map, I want to call out Great Salt Lake, which is right up here now, which is the remnant of Lake Bonneville, which filled this whole area right in here. And was about 20,000, was it kilometers or square miles? I've got, I've got it here in my notes. It'll come right up again. But actually, this whole area had temporary lakes forming in it from time to time. And this is why the uh, floors of the basins in between the ranges are so flat because you had a lot of mineral content washing off these mountains into the lakes. And then that mineral content uh, would settle out once the lakes evaporated away. And that's what they did. They evaporated away. Um, you know, you can look at that and just realize it's, it all looks sedimentary, but how deep is that sediment? How, how deep is the floor underneath that? Uh, I think in the case of Lake Bonneville, it's at least hundreds of feet. Um, I have some specifics. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head the actual depths to bedrock. But those studies have been made. I mean, there are core samples all taken throughout here. So um, so before, yeah. that ha before that happened, is it possible that those were actually deep valleys rather than flat basin floors? Or? Well, yes, that's yeah. exactly the point. Okay. Now... I'm not, I'm not saying that the sediment was all the result of one event. Right. In fact, what, I'm, what, I, what I, I think that it suggests is that there are a series of events. But we'll hit, uh, I'm going to hit the stop share right now and go back to my slides. And then I'll show you a graphic that'll, that will convey to you the extent of the, the bodies of water that accumulated in there. Um, here's a quote from a, uh, a study that was published in 1991. Uh, author was Roger B. Morrison, uh, who the paper was published in the uh, Geology of North America, volume K-2, and part of the Quaternary Non-Glacial Geology in the Conterminous U.S., Chapter 10, pages 283 through 320. Okay, so that's, and it's entitled Quaternary Stratigraphic, Hydrologic, and Climatic History of the Great Basin with Emphasis on Lakes Lahontan, Bonneville, and Tacopa. And this is what he says. Nearly all closed or formerly closed basins in the Great Basin have ancient strand lines marked by lacustrine bars, spits, embankments, terraces, deltas, and wave-cut cliffs at elevations well above the playas or permanent lakes of today. I'll go back. Nearly all closed or formerly closed basins in the Great Basin, have ancient strand lines. What is a strand line? That's a line that's made by the the edge of the surface of the water against. Yeah, the, basically, yeah. it's a shoreline. Shoreline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nearly all of the closed basins have ancient strand lines marked by lacustrine bars. What is lacustrine? Of the lake. Lake. Yes. Lake related bars. This is from. A tributary of water with sediment into it, in it flowing into a lake. So if you have, let's say you have a river coming off the, 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 the hill slope or off the mountain and it's carrying sediment and it's moving relatively fast. What happens when it hits a standing body of water? Slow well, down. yes, it, it begins to uh, deposit its sediment load and it begins building a delta or a bar. All of these things are the consequence, what they're calling lacustrine bars, spits, embankments, terraces, deltas, and wave-cut cliffs. At elevations well above the playas or permanent lakes of today. What is a playa? A playa is, lake is, bed. is an, a, lake bed, yeah. 
yeah, which can from time to time actually hold a temporary lake. Right. You know, if there's a period, you know, of unusual rainfall, there may be a lake, but it usually doesn't last long and it goes back but, into being a, a dry basin. But playa normally doesn't refer to a, the bed of an existing lake, right? Correct. Okay. He goes on to say that the impressive shore features of Lakes Lahontan and Bonneville prompted their study by the U.S. Geological Survey more than a century ago. About 120 pluvial lakes existed within the Great Basin during Wisconsin time. Wisconsin time would be the glacial cycle of probably the last 75 to 100,000 years, roughly. So within that, there we also know that the that the, the the glaciers fluctuated dramatically, much more dramatically than initially conceived of, which maybe even suggests that uh, the Wisconsin should be period of a hundred thousand years roughly should be broken up into some smaller units. But for now, what he's saying is that during this late period of the of the ice age uh, appearances. Um, which is called in North America, the Wisconsin, after obviously the state of Wisconsin, because that's where um, deposits of this age were first studied, just like uh, the Kansas and the Nebraskan ice ages were earlier ice ages, also named after the places where their deposits were first studied, right? So there have been four uh, unique glacial cycles, at least identified the Illinois, Illinoisan, the Kansan, Nebraskan, and the most recent, which is the Wisconsin. So when you see the Wisconsin Ice Age, it's referring specifically to the uh, ice, most recent manifestation of, of Ice Age in North America. Uh, there are different names in Europe. For example, on the European mainland, it's the Verm, um, which was the most, the, the latest in, in the uh, Scandinavia, in uh, the British Isles in that area was the Weichelian, which was when the Fennoscandian ice sheet last appeared and grew to enormous size and then disappeared rapidly in what appears to be about the same window of time as the North American ice complex disappeared. But you have to picture the, the Fennoscandian about roughly the size of the Greenland ice sheet today. So it was not an insubstantial amount of ice. Yeah, that's a lot of ice. That's a lot of ice. Yeah, more ice than you could shovel in an, a in a weekend. Yeah, it might take off your driveway. Weekends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so let's look at a quick map. Uh, get this up and boom, boom. Okay, I did a little graphic to help people uh, visualize what we we'll what we'd be talking about here. All right, so there's the basin and range. The, the Great Basin, I'm going to encircle with my, notice the circularity of it. Do you see the, the circularity? Other than oh, yeah. this northern rim, Yeah. Um, it really is like a vast, so I've often wondered if it couldn't have been one of part of the early bombardment, you know, mm. period of the solar system. There could be a remnant. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. That'd be a big one. That'd be a biggie, but that <laughs> yeah. would have probably been three and a half billion years ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I accidentally jumped ahead, but you're going to see what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put in uh, color in blue everywhere where there appears to have been lakes. I'm not necessarily saying that all these lakes existed at the same time or at their maximum depth. I haven't seen enough studies, and I don't think anybody has really done a comprehensive effort to correlate the timing of these. But if they were all extant at the same time, then they would look something about like this. Wow. It does so, kind of look like they would all be connected, like you couldn't really fill one basin. Yes, but there is, see, the thing is, again, there's no outlet to the ocean. Right. Right. So any water draining off the highlands around here is going to pool up in here and is going to be completely dependent upon the ratio between rainfall, between precipitation and evaporation. And as long as precipitation exceeds 
evaporation, the lakes will accumulate. Then if precipitation uh, is, is proportional to evaporation, that they're in equilibrium, then it'll sustain the lakes. If the precipitation declines relative to the amount of evaporation, the lakes are going to start disappearing. And it, basically that's what's happened. If you jump back one, there's Great Salt Lake right there. So you can see how that's just a yeah. puddle, a mere puddle left mm -hmm. over. Over here is Pyramid Lake, right right here. Now, I'll go in. Pyramid was part of this much larger complex of, of ancient lakes. But it's just a, a, a puddle that's that's left there now. I mean, that this must have been lake. a night. You're, you're basically all of Nevada there and half of Utah and going into Idaho and Arizona, some of California. So that's a huge expanse for that lake yeah. to be covered. Yeah. It's yeah. an enormous amount of water. And I imagine it would be pretty easy to get lost in there if you were trying to navigate it. I mean, even if you, you know, were using the stars, you get met, you get lost in the maze of little mountain ranges. Yeah, if you were in there in your rubber raft trying yeah. to navigate. Yeah, right. How do I get to that mountain range where my family is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to the water. What I'm going to do, I want to I call everyone's attention up here to the north. And you see this right here, this what appears to be like a river flowing. This is actually the lowest saddle uh, spillover, spillway out of the, out of the basin. Uh, and it actually would funnel water into the Snake River, which ultimately leads into the Columbia River, which then discharges at the Pacific Ocean north of Portland. But that is the lowest, the lowest saddle, the lowest, um, yeah, valley, call is the, actually the term, C-O-L, that as the waters rose up, now you got to bear in mind that right here in in the Bonneville Basin, the waters rose up about a thousand feet deeper than than Great Salt Lake now is about a thousand feet, and only at that point did it finally spill start spilling over through this valley here. And when we come back from the break, we're going to start looking at this phenomena of the Bonneville flood, which was the spillover of Lake Bonneville. Um, All right. So, so that's where we'll pick it up when we come back. Let me just add in there while you got that last little picture talking about it. Great Salt Lake as a puddle, you know, as as big as it is in uh, you know square area, it's it's maximum thirty three feet deep. Yeah. Right. You know, it's average like fifteen feet deep. So it is literally just this shallow little puddle of that huge. Lake Bonneville that's gone, drained out that little area that we're going to look at after the break. So yeah, just want to yes, throw that perspective in there. Yeah. So the next time any of you listeners are at uh, the Great Salt Lake and you meet some people, you should complain about how small it is <laughs> compared to what the lake used to be. Yeah. You should say, Hey, what is this Great Salt Lake? <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. You know. All right. We'll be right back. Right back. Of course, it's 33 oh. feet deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, before we get back into the main material, again, we want to mention cbdfromthegods.com. Uh, great company. Randall, did you have something uh, you wanted to share about about uh, CBD from the gods? A couple of things. Well, I know I've just been informed that they're extending their uh, discounts and free shipping, the uh, discounted sales into March. So um, I think they're just trying to get their product out there because... Uh, it could be helpful during these times, uh, if for no no other reason, in you know helping people sleep better and de stress, but it could be also having an important immune system function. But uh, so I think they're doing twenty percent across the board, so it's a good time to to grab some stuff. Um, and then of course and, you can put the RC ships free 
promo right. code in there and that'll get you free shipping as well. Right. And uh, they're, they've just developed a strain of Oregon, excuse me, Oregon grown organic um, CBD flower, hand harvested, um, hand trimmed. And it's a smokable version of the, the CBD oil. And it's not intoxicating. It's it's a totally legal product. But uh, I'm going to give that a try and see what that's like, just for fun. Um, but I will say this. I, Brad mentioned this, I think, last episode or a recent episode since you've been doing it. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it too much. But as soon as you said it, I, I realized, yeah, I've been having a lot of dreaming. Um, nope. Uh, more dreaming, you know, in the last month or two that, um, you know, like prior to that, I'd barely remember my dreams when I woke up. Now it's like I'm, you know, it's a whole major Hollywood production, <laughs> you know, with, uh, That's cool. <laughs> with, you know, actors and character actors and walk-ins and, and, um, subplots and, and special and, effects, <laughs> you know, part two and part ca- three casts of thousands of extras. <laughs> what? Part two and three, you wake up and then you go back to sleep. Yes. And it continues on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the weird one there. How does that happen? How does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> but Ka- Kyle, you say that this is, you made a comment last time about that, um, that it's oh, the rapid t- eye movement. The, R- the REM sleep. Yeah. yeah I think R- Russ R- was saying R- that, but yeah, when you get more of that, that's, that's, uh, I mean, dream time, typically yeah. when you're dreaming, that's uh, uh, signifying you're getting better sleep. Well, I know right? that I'm sleeping much longer periods without waking up. Yeah. Rather so than waking up every couple of hours, sometimes waking up and being awake for an hour or two. Yeah. Man, I'm sleeping. I'm going to yeah, bed and I'm for sleeping sure. for six hours, seven which hours means, without which waking means you up. you have time so, to have big, massive Hollywood production dreams. Yeah, that must be it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's one thing that I've certainly noticed is my, my sleep regimen has changed since I've been doing this CBD. And I, I don't know what else to attribute it to because, you know, I've, I've been a light sleeper and a nocturnal, you know, waking up since I was a kid, literally since I was a kid. So we'll see where it goes. I mean, I'm just uh, looking forward to trying the, the smokable and s- supposedly it's very gentle and, um, is a very uh, effective delivery route for the for the cannabinoids. So we'll see. Is that something that goes through a vape system, or you just have to have a little pipe for it, or roll it up? I think, you, yeah, any one of the above. I think. Huh, okay, just like smoking the illegal stuff, except that this is legal. All right, I'm just not familiar with it yet. So yeah, we're learning. Yeah, we're learning, but yep. uh, so yeah. Oregon grown, hand harvested, hand trimmed, smokable CBD flower. I'm going to give it a shot and I'll be reporting back to you what my and impressions are. And it's legal? Totally. Totally. Well, it's because it. Normal guys yeah, impressed. <laughs> does not have the uh, THC in it. Only I trace think, amounts. Only trace amounts of THC. I think Oregon just decriminalized all drug usage and they're starting to new, have new programs for addicts instead of putting them in jail. I just heard that the other day. I don't know. Well, that's long overdue. Definitely. Yep. But I think they're the first state to do it. Yeah. Well, we'll, well, I've we'll been, see how I've, it works. I've been out of the oil for three days and I can tell. So really? Can you really? Yeah. Hopefully yeah. my new shipment's going to get here. I was wondering what the deal was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've seemed like totally worn out the past couple of nights. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, but yeah, check them out. CBD, uh, CBD from the gods.com promo code RC ships free. All right. And thanks to everybody who has uh purchased from them. It really helps us out. Helps out the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, getting our metrics up. So it helps, yep. it helps me sure. and Russ get a, get a good night's sleep. That's right. It's worth a try. We're getting reports from, uh, listeners that have, that have made the purchase and, uh, they're having good effects too. See them in the con- comments pretty regularly on the yeah uh, good YouTube. Okay, so uh, let's get back to Lake Bonneville. Okay, giant um, billboard moment over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
He says, uh, going on with the same, the same article by Roger B. Morrison, a 1991 uh, article that appeared in the Quaternary Non-Glacial Geology of the Conterminous U.S., which was a, a publication of the um, uh, Geological Society of America, by the way. He says, goes on on page 300 and 301 of the book, he says, Lake Bonneville became the largest pluvial lake in the Western Hemisphere about seventeen to 15,000 years ago. At its maximum, it inundated several coalescent intermontane basins in northwest Utah. Intermontane just means in between the mountains, okay? Intermontane basins in northwest Utah, extending into Idaho and Nevada, had an area of about 51,700 square kilometers, which is about the size of Lake Michigan today. And it had a maximum depth of 315 meters. And 315 meters is exactly 1,033 feet deep. No, actually exactly 1,033.2 feet deep. So you can say legitimately that it was over 1,000 feet deep in its deepest sections. Today, the only permanent lakes are Great Salt Lake and Utah lakes. Lake Bonneville's history remains controversial. Nearly every serious researcher on Lake Bonneville silt since Gilbert has come up with a different interpretation. So, uh, by the way, 51,700 square kilometers is just under 20,000 square miles. Okay, so now. Now you are sharing a screen. Now I am sharing a screen. You know, I've always you, liked, I like to share. Did you make that map from the uh, USGS software, the online stuff? You know what? To be honest, I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, I've been using this map in this particular presentation for well over a decade. But it's a cool good. map, isn't it? It is cool. The other one, too. Yeah. So check out this RQ8 feature here, which is the Snake River Plain. And we're going to take a little journey from Great Salt Lake here up through the valleys that represent the spillway through which the uh, Great uh, Lake Bonneville overflowed to cause the Bonneville flood. And about 300, more than 300 feet uh, decline in the water level. As was, in other words, as the lake drained out, the water level from its high stand declined over 300 feet. Now, watch carefully. And you see the blue arrow? Yep. That shows the spillway out of the basin. And this, in that whole rim of the basin, which was obviously thousands of miles in circumference, this was the lowest point. So this was the first point as the waters rose up. This was the first point at which they spilled over. So we're going to follow the flood as it breaches what is now called Red Rock Pass, right in here, and then spills out through the Portneuf Valley out onto the Snake River Plain right here, and then flows west. And you can follow the trace of the flood carving this valley right here, and then it flows up and goes into Hell's Canyon. So there's a map of Lake Bonneville. Um, and this would have been at its maximum. And right up here, you see, is where the spillover occurred. Everywhere else, it's a, at a higher elevation. So there's nowhere else. I mean, if the water was able to, in other words, if you plug this valley here, and the water would keep rising, it would find other spillways out of the basin, the Great Basin. But this was the first because this was the lowest. So once it began to exploit this spillway, and the water started overflowing, um, it rapidly 
cut down and removed over 300 feet of rock. And essentially there was a, uh, there was a series of sedimentary fans you'll see here as we go up through the, through the dis, the spillway, the discharge spillway that or served as the original dam that blocked the, the pass, the free passage of the waters. Um, but then at some point the waters rose high enough that they began to flow over the top of this, uh, the sedimentary plugs, uh, that were del Delta fans basically that had, uh, developed from erosion off the adjacent mountains. So here is the 20,000 miles of uh, area drowned that is now just completely arid valleys. Lake Bonneville, of course, is, you know, well known for the, the its aftermath, the Bonneville salt flats that were the, the, the mineral deposition that is so flat uh, that it was used for the uh, temp member was used for testing of high performance vehicles. Um, I know Brad would certainly be familiar with that. Oh yeah. Still is. Yep. Still is. Okay. Oh yeah. I'd... Rocket cars. Rocket cars. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is just a topographic, which shows um, the comparison of modern great salt lake at its maximum historical extent compared to uh, Lake Bonneville. And you can see this black outline here is modern Great Salt Lake. And then you can see right up here. So the idea is that, that once it breached that, um, would you call it the call? Is that the? The call, think of, a, think of two mountains with a kind of a saddle between them. And that yeah. low saddle is called a call, C-O-L. So, so it breached that. Cut it down 300 feet or so, drained all that out catastrophically, and then the rest went away by evaporation down to what the Salt Lake is now? That is exactly That's right. Okay. So you had the highest level is left a shoreline called the Bonneville shoreline. And then when it cut through the, the dam at Red Rock Pass and quickly eroded because that was a fairly soft material from, a, you know, because it was fan material that had, had accumulated um, from erosion off the mountain flanks. And actually, if you look at this graphic right here, right here, this northern point, right here at this constriction where my, my arrow is, that's where the sedimentary plug was, the dam. And the water rose up against it. And at some point it rose high enough that it it, it's overspilled the top. And once it did that, it quickly eroded it down so it that initially it, it would have been somewhat slower, but accelerating at an exponential pace. And then it would have been a catastrophic failure. And then at that point, the whole lake level began to begin to uh, an extended drawdown. And estimates are anywhere from a few weeks to a year that it took to draw down the lake, depending upon the peak discharge of, uh, of the overflow and the uh, duration of that peak discharge. And I, I don't think there's any consensus on that. And so, you know, the, 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 the longer the peak discharge was sustained, the quicker the 300 plus foot drawdown would occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, and that would depend on how quickly it was able to erode that pass. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right, so here's an aerial view just north. This is the Wasatch Mountains. This is just north of Salt Lake City. And you can see the shoreline right along the base of the mountains there. It's super obvious. And I just did a really quick crude graphic just to try to give you the idea. Oh, yeah. You see that? I'm sure a much better graphic could be done, but but that certainly conveys the idea. And here's an aerial shot flying into Salt Lake City and look upon on the Wasatch Mountains. Can you see the shoreline right there? Oh yeah. Look at that. It's really very, obvious. Very clear. Yeah. Very clear. Yep. It's even more obvious here. Now, this is about right here in this area. It's about 900 feet above the valley floor. You know, when, when we were in Montana and we were in that 
the valley there um, that used to be the lake bed. I was fascinated to see the same kind of markings on the mountains. I mean, it's like the soil has been leached out and it's still there, what, 12,000 years later. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what, what causes that leaching? So, you know, not even trees would, would grow or were growing on those, those mountainsides in Montana. Well, you got to bear in mind that you're looking at a, a lot of the, whatever topsoil would have been there was stripped away to down to bare rock. And so above the water, you didn't have that same level of uh, severity of, of erosion. Whereas below the water level, everything is stripped away down to bare rock. So once the, the, the water is drained away, you've got this very distinct line of demarcation below which you've just got bare rock. And up above that, you've got enough pockets of topsoil that, you know, organic plant material can can much quicker claim, okay. reclaim the area above the, the floodwaters. Okay. Now here, you can see the two shorelines, the Bonneville and the Provo. Check this out. I'll do a little animation here. There's the Bonneville shoreline, right? Now that's the high water mark of Lake Bonneville. And that's, again, nearly 1,000 feet above the valley floor. And then when the dam up north of here in Red Rock Pass was breached, the water drained down. And then you have to bear in mind that once that sedimentary, softer sedimentary material was removed, I've forgotten, I think it was a granite sill. I think it was a hard, whatever it was, it was a hard granite or maybe it was a hard metamorphic rock. So once the overflowing waters ate its way through the softer sedimentary material and hit that solid uh, quartzite or a uh, hard uh, metamorphic rock, it stabilized, you see. And so then you had this longer period of time where the remaining lake then slowly evaporated away over th several thousand years. But that lower level, uh, after that first initial 320 foot or whatever it was drawdown, left the Provo shoreline, which is that. But these, it seems like these are, the, the evaporation of the lake and the spilling over are connected, right? Because whatever uh, climatic scenario was, was going on that kept the lake full and kept it from evaporating obviously changed at the Obvious, time that the lake spilled yes, over. That is precisely correct, Kyle. And that is probably one of the important takeaways from all of this is that prior to this to the spillover you had one climate regime yeah. dominating and then after it was all over you had a completely different one yeah um now the question in my mind is that number one there's evidence that throughout the late wisconsin probably for tens of thousand years there were more lakes because bear in mind, when that ice sheet was just to the north of here, what, maybe 500 miles, the jet stream was shunted around to the south of the ice sheet, typically. And what that did was it brought more moisture to the arid regions of the west. So there would have been more rainfall, which means there would have been a very different uh, biome there. For one thing, there would have been a lot more lakes, right? There would have been a lot more flowing rivers, uh, a lot more vegetation, which has been well established from uh, pollen studies and, and things like that. So, But then it's one thing to say that, okay, there might have been a lake 100 feet deep in the Bonneville Basin. But to say it's 1,000 feet deep is, is a whole different matter because basically, again, for a lake to form, the the volume of precipitation has to exceed the volume of, evapor of evaporation. So how skewed does that ratio have to become to fill this basin, this huge basin, 20,000 square miles, up to 1,033 feet deep? Was, it a, was this a prolonged filling or was it a rapid filling? And if it was a prolonged filling, you know, what caused the change so that 
the, well, clearly, I would think that the disappearance of the ice sheet then allowed the jet stream to migrate to the north, carrying its, its moisture with them. So that would be one explanation. But then that gets back to, well, wait a second. You can't talk about getting rid of, you know, six million cubic miles of glacial ice piled up a mile, mile and a half thick over half the, the continent without talking about some kind of a climate change or some kind of an environmental yeah. change and change in such a way that, you know, the glaciers didn't come back. Lake Bonneville didn't come back. But yep. there's when the evidence. In, there's the mute evidence. There's the shorelines right there. When I was in Utah, I went, we went to uh, Moab. Yeah. Um, just to do some, ride some trails. And uh, we went looking at petroglyphs and stuff one day, and I was reading about the the ancient environment where these, because, you know, the, the natives painted stuff on these rocks way up there in places it was looked like it was impossible to get to. Mm-hmm. And so what I read about was that, you know, way back there were all these forests and all that just totally looked different. Now it's just bare rock everywhere. Um, but they were talking about these monsoons that would come up from the Gulf of Mexico that would constantly Mm -hmm. bring moisture to the area. So the rivers were up and all, but, you know, based on this whole thing, I mean, that kind of makes me think, well, maybe all that moisture actually left or stopped coming up at the, at the Younger Dryas event or the end of the Younger Dryas or whichever. I don't know which one we're talking about here, the, the flooding of the lake. Is that at the beginning, the onset? Well, we'll get to that. It's in the Wisconsin glaciation, so. <clears throat> well, it was definitely towards the end of the glaciation. Okay, yeah. But the dating, like it said in that quote that I read from, there's a lot of controversy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but that just, I mean, it seems like they would be tied, those two <laughs> stories, right, that these natives that lived there that did all, painted all these or carved all these petroglyphs were living in a uh, a lush, lush environment that yeah. had lots of rainfall well that would have kept that basin from evaporating yeah well clearly even throughout the holocene there's been enormous climate changes including periods of greater moisture in the arid lands of the west western north america um so not necessarily correlated directly then to those. Not those necessarily events. correlated directly because for one thing, I think the petroglyphs are all, you know, what, 2,000 to 5,000 years ago? Yeah, the that's what part. they're saying. That's what they say. I'm just trying yeah. to imagine, you know, uh, I'm comparing the this apparently lush, you know, forested, lots of rainfall. Uh-huh. And then right next door is a lake that's evaporating. That's kind of... Strange. Yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it it's a lot weird, in my opinion. And even if those petroglyphs aren't from that time, there were certainly people in, you know, here when the lake was way when Bonneville was up at its height. You know, yes, and they probably were. There were probably oh, people around and, the shore that experienced it start to drop. And megafaunal you know, remains have been found. Yeah, that were obviously, you know grazing around the shores of the lake yep yeah it'd be really interesting to dig into some of those uh, uh what did you call them the debris fans th- yeah from the rivers that were entering the lake you know because people would live on the streams that are running into the lake yep. yeah yeah who knows what you could find in, in all that sediment that would be really would be a fun be dig a big sifter wouldn't yeah, that be a fun be dig <laughs> but it would be more fun if you were doing the digging kyle and i was sitting back comfortably in a chair with a sun hat on watching. Well, I, I would just be in an air conditioned cab with two joysticks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. While I'm outside sweating in the, yeah, that's right. in your lounge chair, <laughs> in my lounge chair. Okay. Let us continue on here with our, uh, with our exploration. All right. So there's our two shorelines. Here's just another map again to help people envision I want you to look at Highway 15 that comes up through here, Mallard City, through Downey, comes up here, and then it hooks to the west, and then comes out, discharges out onto the Snake River Plain right at Pocatello and American Falls Reservoir. So that's the route out. That's the route that the, that the overflow 
uh, took right here where this 90 state highway 91 marker is. That is where the pass was, where the, where the plug was. So south of here, the lake was dammed. Now the question is how long was the span of time between the lake reaching its maximum depth at the Bonneville shoreline and the point at which it breached the sedimentary dam? I don't know. Long enough to leave a prominent shoreline, though. So, but again, that's a, an important question it needs to be worked out. How long of a how long did it take to fill the lake? And then once it was filled, how long did it stay at that Bonneville shoreline before it was able to eat its way through the sedimentary dam and then flow out catastrophically? Uh, out here, and the peak discharge, by the way, uh, has been estimated to be up to about forty million cubic feet per second. All right, so here, here's the spillway out right here, coming up this way, and this is this is the Portneuf Valley right here, and this is where it hooks to the west. It almost does a right angle turn. It's flowing north, hooks to the west, and then discharges right here at uh, Poc Pocatello is now in the in the mouth here and uh, this is this is uh, Red Rock Pass itself and Red Rock Pass is right in here is where and here's the remnant of a sedimentary dam right here so you see this material filled this whole valley right here the waters of the lake came up and met that dam right in here somewhere. And then the waters overtopped the sedimentary dam. And then again, because it was a, a, a much softer material, it quickly ate its way down until it met bedrock. And once it got to that bedrock sill, it stabilized. And that's what established the Provo shoreline. Um, and then again, the question is, is how long did it take for that 300 and some feet to draw down before the lake between the high stand of the lake and its relative stabilization at the Provo shoreline. And this is in the pass itself. As it says here, this is red rocks, uh, which gave their name to the overflow spillway of Lake Bonneville. Let me move this so I can read it. At this point, the waters of the, in quotes, Bonneville River flowed 300 feet deep. So that would have been just enough to overtop this outcrop right here. And this is this is why it's called Red Rocks. It's, um, I've forgotten the, the lithology here, but that's not important at this point. The rock outcrop here is an eroded remnant of the former landscape. The elevation of the high point on Red Rock Butte is about 5,050 feet above sea level. The highway is about 4,770 feet above sea level at this point. This is virtually the same elevation as the Provo shoreline of Lake Bonneville. So in other words, go back to that picture where I had the two, the magenta and the green lines de defining the two shorelines. Okay, so at 4,770 feet above sea level, that was the lower of the shorelines, and this right here, this passage through um, the uh, this, essentially this was the spillway. And up here would have been the land surface prior to the to the flood. Does that make sense? So this is like a remnant of of that softer material that was filling this valley. So the water initially would have been flowing up here where my arrow is. And then it would have eaten its way through 300 feet of rock and then stabilized at this level. And you can actually trace this elevation all the way around large segments of the basin. And that's what we were seeing on that previous slide. So, yeah, just another map to help you uh, get the picture. Here at INCOM is where it, it took a sharp turn to the west through Black rock. Here's Portneuf. So there was a narrows right here, a constriction. Then it flowed through here, came up this way, and then it discharged out onto the Snake River Plain. And the erosion 
undoubtedly scoured a hollow right here that is now being used. There's a dam down here at the south end of American Falls, so it's being used as a reservoir. And you see, here's the snake feeding in from the northwest um, that heads up in the, the head of the snake is up in the Tetons. And it flows out of there, comes down here. Here's American Falls Reservoir. And then you can even see it on this map. Notice the difference of the lake of the river flowing out of American Falls Reservoir compared to the river flowing in. Yeah, it's in a big channel. Yes, exactly. Because the waters came out and poured down this way. And there's Incom, Black Rock. You can see that right here. And you can see some of the sedimentary features from the, the water flowing here and then hooking to the west and then up and out this way. And here's the discharge point at Poc Pocatello is right here. Notice here's where it's splaying out onto the Snake River Plain. Check this out. You've got a deeper erosional channel right here that's now occupied by this river. Well, it's probably a creek, actually. But look at this. You see the streamline form right here? Oh, yeah. Look at that. And you can actually see the scouring. Look at this. You can see the curved lines like this. This is the water pouring around this way, pouring around this way and uh, flowing to the southwest. You see this streaking? Yep. In, yep. And I then those, getting those, those 90 degree turns inside that pass must have been something to witness too. When it, oh my when God. It yes. The there. turbulence yeah. in there would have been phenomenal. Yeah. And there's probably, if you were able to vacuum out all the sediment, you'd probably see, you know, yeah. collections of giant potholes and boulders that are buried on the bedrock floor in the uh, buried yeah. under sediment. Yeah. Okay. So then going down, where you saw that when we were looking at the section of river discharging from the southwestern end of American Falls Reservoir, this is kind of what we're beginning to see. You can follow the trace. Now, this is interesting because, look, what you're seeing here is the evidence that the water was initially a sheet flood over this whole landscape. And you'll notice right here, um, you've got, there's actually, we'll zoom in on this area, but you see there's a headward eroding cataract right here. So you had water flowing, and you can see the beginning of channelization right here. It's very similar to what we were looking at with Nakalula Falls. Remember? We were looking at Nakalula yeah. Falls in north uh, eastern Alabama. Yep. And we saw, we could see where it was beginning to ch the channelization, and then once it gets into that focused flow regime, it becomes highly erosive, and it starts eating uh, a, a, a canyon, and it eats it upstream right yeah and that's what you see right here and look right over here here's another instance of that you see so this is water flowing outside this channel now eventually the water becomes confined to the channel but if you look in here you'll see a lot of streamlining and you know on these these digital maps the the evidence of hydraulic activity is really starting to show up in incredible ways. Now that was the uh, the picture behind you, right? That that dark cliff edge right there, just to the right of the middle, is is what's in the picture behind you. Yeah, you mean right here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that cliff because that 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 little notch behind you is that it's not a re-entrant; it's actually flowing out right uh -huh. behind your head there. Hmm. Yeah, that's massive rocks right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Let's see. I should uh, stop the share for a second. Then I'm going to go back to uh, the national map, and we're going to take a look here at the Snake River Plain. There's something I want to call your attention to on the Snake River Plain. So I'm going to take off the tilt. Let's see. Well, either way. It, it looks real good. Now, so you can help to get the longer range picture of, of what's going on here geologically. 
Okay, so here's the Snake River Plain is this very noticeable arcuate form, right? Well, over here is Yellowstone. And here's where you have that magmatic upwelling, the, right. the mantle plume coming up, the hot spot, right? Well, somewhere about 17, 16 to 17 million years ago, there began a long series of eruptions uh, that created the Columbia Basalt Plateau and the Snake River Plain. But what you have to picture here is that uh, the crust is moving to the west and it's moving over this hot spot. I'm going to actually stop to share for a second. And it's rotating a little bit. Here's the mantle plume. Here's here, here here's the hot spot, right? Coming up on the bottom of the of the crust, and the crust is moving over it. And yeah. as the crust is moving over it, imagine it's almost like a blowtorch, and it's essentially melting the surface there. And so it's leaving a trace of its passage. The crust is leaving a very distinct trace of its passage over this hot spot, right? And that is the Snake River Plain. Now, I don't know if I have the quote here. I don't have the quote, but I actually will be quoting from David Alt, where he uh, surmises that 17 million years ago, there was a major impact. And if we back up, if we put this, this westward motion of the crust in reverse, basically, you see this area right here, this kind of yeah. circular area, jumbled, broken area. It goes right back here and right there. It's sitting on top of the Yellowstone hotspot. Now, how cool is that? So that impact may have created the plume. Is that the idea? And it's That's been- the idea. Now, okay. of course, nobody's proven it. I haven't right. seen anybody challenge the idea. And we'll get back and I'll actually share the full his full uh, uh, explanation of it on, on an upcoming podcast. Because to me, it's a very very compelling idea. Yeah. But so the impact had, happens, it makes the plume. And then as the crust moves, the, the plume is generating this arcuate smooth feature. Yes. And what, what you're action. actually doing is this, this arcuate feature, which is a snake river plane is actually tracing the movement the of the low, crust. Yeah. The low movement of the crust over top of the plume, which is, yeah. Okay. Right. Wow. So if you were to run this in reverse, this area here would back right up, right over here. And it would park itself right over, yeah. The Yellowstone hotspot. Wow. And then the, the flow of magma, it bled for 10 million years. Uh, and during that 10 million years, it built the entire Columbia basalt plateau, which is this thing, which is where the channel scab lands are. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I love it. A volcano I know. going off for 10 million years yes. is hard <laughs> to believe, but wow. There should be some heavy metal bands that should uh, use this type of material, <laughs> yeah, for some yeah. songs. And uh, but but it was a dec- declining uh, magma floods that occurred. Yeah, but magma initially floods. they were they were real huge, and and you can see that 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 the initial uh, flood basalt f- floods were were much more copious than the later ones. Just just like a wound b- bleeds. Profi- uh, prolifically at first, and then the the blood flow subsides, and then eventually stops. Although the hot spot is still there and is still active, and is it going to build up enough pressure to erupt again? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But uh, yeah, if so we that's get hit by something somewhere else. It probably will, right? If what if we say have, that if again? we have another, if we have an imp- a big impact somewhere else, it will probably erupt again. Well, maybe, maybe that yeah. would serve as the trigger. Yeah. Um. So let's see. I'm zooming in here. Here's this. Here's this right angle turn at Incom, and you can see the water float out this way, and you can actually kind of visualize how the water spilled out this way and then begin to flow down. There was undoubtedly a pre-flood Snake River Valley, but it would have been much shallower than the canyon that's there now that was cut by the 40 million cubic feet per second. So let's see here. If I zoom in there. Oh, yeah, so that's what we were 
That's what we were looking at a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah. And here was that dark wall where massacre. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's a cataract. Yeah. You can see cataracts all along that. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, like the other one you were showing us, there's cataracts uh, uh, off, to, off to the left there. Yeah. You can see them. Yeah. Right in there. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And look, here you can see the the channelization beginning. Yeah. Here, I'll turn off the uh, tinted hill shade once. Man. And you can kind of see the plucking. Oh yeah. Uh that you were talking that you talk about with the channel scab lands too, like those sheet floods. You can mm -hmm. see that it is And you can see here how the water spreads out. And it looks like there was some overland flow coming in this way, right up here. There's an obvious yeah. channel, shallower than this. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll actually take the transparency down a bit. I like that. Take that off. There we go. So yeah, the the water, the work of the cataclysmic water flow shows up pretty clearly. Look at this. Look at this the streamlined erosional residual right there midstream. And I mean it's pretty clear uh cutting of the edges there too. I mean it's Oh yeah. Are, yeah, are very clear. You got all this this rough mountainous terrain and then it's just flat. And then it's just flat, yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Massacre Rocks is, it's all of this right here. Right. Mm. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So like Brad said, that's what's behind me. Yeah. Uh, on this, on the, uh, the backdrop. So let's stop that. And go back to this. Okay, so Harold Maud, this was one of the seminal studies done on the Bonneville flood published back in 1968 by Harold Maud. This was in the uh, one of the U.S. Geological Survey professional papers. The Bonneville flood mostly occupied the same canyons and valleys that exist today, but it modified them by causing extensive erosion and by depositing great piles of flood debris. It left a vivid record of its cataclysmic passage. And here is just some of the st quick statistics. Uh, elevation of the Bonneville shoreline, elevation of Red Rock Pass. Notice that the elevation of the Provo shoreline is only five feet different than the elevation of Red Rock Pass. And peak discharge, 35 to 41 million cubic feet per second. Total volume was 1,140 cubic miles of water. Oh um, wow. So that's not quite twice the volume of Glacial Lake Missoula. Assumed duration, several weeks to months. So this is looking north into Red Rock Pass. So... Basically, if we were standing here, you know, 14 or 15,000 years ago, um, we would be quickly swept away by uh, a raging river three miles, I mean, 300 feet deep. And it flowed, it's flowing north down through this valley here. Look, you can see the rock outcrops. This is, this is yeah. that, that same rock outcrop. So this was the pre-flood valley floor up here okay so this is looking down into marsh valley which is just north of the the breakout point so water flow from south which was to the left flowing to the north uh as it says here looking west into red rock pass the spillway for the overflowing waters of lake bonneville the valley beyond the foothills carried approximately 35 million cubic feet per second flow is from left to right 
Here, the Great Bonneville River, River would have been about 300 feet deep and three miles wide. So that's quite a river. An yeah, impressive flow a, of water, I would say. Yeah. And this is nearby Sawtooth Mountains, and this is what's called a cirque. And this is a, a gathering ground for mountain glaciers. So during the end of the Ice Age, this whole mountain was almost overtopped with massive glaciers filling these cirques and then flowing down into the, uh, into the valleys. And as I say here, the melting glaciers would have drained into the Payette River watershed, which flows to the Snake River via the Boise River. Could this melting have contributed to the Bonneville flood? And I think it, it could have, actually. Uh, there may have been uh, sources of water from melting mountain glaciers augmenting the overflow of Lake Bonneville is what I'm speculating here. Um, so, yeah, just another topographic map to help get the visualization of the discharge point. There's Pocatello. Clearly, a town like Pocatello, if you had that 40 million cubic feet per second discharging out here, there would be no more trace of Pocatello. And here's an aerial view. Incom is right here. So here comes the flood from the north, I mean from the south. And look up here on the on the hillsides. You can see yeah. that same. It's clear. Yeah, right there. That's, there's the high water mark right there. And so these channels coming in from the tributaries, they would have been cut post-flood because the flood coming through would have essentially wiped all this away and then would have left this super saturated ground that then uh, was eroded. So this, these, these features are, would be Holocene erosion. So you can see here's where it made this right angle turn sweeping around here and then coming down and discharging at Pocatello. And there's where it opens out onto the Snake River Plain. As you can see, there wouldn't be much left of Pocatello if 40 million cubic feet per second came roaring out of this valley here. Okay, so let's see. Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve. This is a 10 to 12,000 year old uh, lava discharge to show that, uh, showing that there's still residual activity going on here. This is a very interesting place to visit. And I'm thinking at Probably not this year, but next year we'll, we, we should do a Bonneville flood tour. We start there somewhere around Salt Lake and head north and just traverse the whole um, countryside that we're, that we're um, traveling here. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, I think that, yeah it, it would, yeah, it would be an awesome. So here we go. Yeah. We're getting into uh, Massacre Rock State Park. So you can see. This is some of the uh, mute evidence of the cataclysmic nature of these floodwaters that passed over this land. Yeah, here's that cliff. This is that cliff right here. Boulders. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. And look, you see Scale Man down there? <laughs> yeah. Is that Brad? No, I think that's our good friend Wilbur, ah. who was on this trip with us. Yeah. Um, so Massacre Rock, Snake River, Idaho, this is one of the first of many great boulder deposits strewn in the path of the mighty Bonneville flood. Note the flood distributary notch in the opposite riverbank. So I think we determined, Brad, that this was a distributary and not a tributary, right? It's blowing out, not yeah. in. Yeah, so a distributary, rather, a tributary is flowing in. Distributary, yes. Yeah, so that's what the, this was. This was, and it shows then that the water was up to this level because it had to spill over and yeah, start breached, cutting down this channel. It breached that and started cutting it down. Wow. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see that. Well, there it is on the map there. You can see it clearly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right here. okay. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Yep. But I think these cataracts show that really what was happening is initially water was flowing over the whole area here in like a big sheet. And then it began to focus into the channel 
So it this would have been a distributary here, but these cataracts would have been cut by sheet floods that are flowing over the surface of the land here, which again, you know, it shows that the water not only rose to the top here, it was flowing above the top by some unspecified distance, which I imagine we could determine by a finding there's probably very distinct shorelines in here somewhere, strand lines that would give you the highest water depth. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's Bradley, and there's some of the sediment. This is in Massacre Rock State Park. Those are fairly impressive boulders. Yeah. Now, you know, just contemplate for a moment the power of a flood that would be transporting those boulders and then dropping them there. And that's where they've sat for 13, 14, 15,000 years. And no force of nature has even come close to being able to move those two rocks. So, but there was a force of nature able to transport those rocks and place them there. And then this is looking, you know, into sections of the canyon. This is about 400 feet deep. Shoshone Falls is on the Snake River. This is this is another uh, 1987, uh, so uh, 19 years after his 68 article, Harold Maud wrote uh, an article on Shoshone Falls, Idaho, a Pleistocene relic of the catastrophic Bonneville flood. Shoshone Falls is on the Snake River about four miles northeast of the city of Twin Falls, near the midpoint of a chaotically eroded 14-mile section of the Snake River Canyon. Shoshone Falls was an important landmark in the geological exploration of the West, but evidence that the falls are a relic of a great Pleistocene flood has been recognized only recently. As now understood, Shoshone Falls and its associated erosional features were formed at a time of catastrophic outflow from Lake Bonneville about 15,000 years ago. And there's Shoshone Falls. Now, its discharge varies quite a bit throughout the, throughout the year. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very impressive stop. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Shoshone Falls is at the junction of two channels of the Bonneville Flood one along the narrow Snake River Canyon and the other on the upland a few miles north. Where the channels joined, the flood erosion produced a chaotically eroded landscape of cataracts, spillway alcoves, and scab land, and the original canyon was greatly enlarged. The main cataracts begin 2.5 miles above Shoshone Falls, where the canyon is 230 feet deep. These cataracts called the Twin Falls plunge 157 feet from basalt to massive outcrops of silicic volcanic rocks in the lower story of the canyon. The snake then drops another 212 feet to the threshold of Pillar Falls, 1.5 miles downstream. Pillar Falls, although only 20 feet high, is surrounded by scabland crags that reach 175 feet. So I'm going to stop, share there, go back to the map, and let's see if we can't locate um, Shoshone Falls on the map. All right, there we go. Oh, yeah, look at that. Ooh. Yeah. Tortured. Tortured is right. So, you know, he's talking about the upland flow that, that did this. So, in other words, just he's saying not all the water is flowing confined yeah. to the channel. Yeah, you can see that it was right flowing across the top there. Yeah. Cut, cutting those cataracts. Cut, cutting them cataracts. Yep. All right. Well, yeah, so we'll, what we'll do is next episode we'll pick up on the uh, – following the route of the Bonneville flood up to where it meets the 
the Snake meets the Clearwater River, and we're going to look right there because that is the place where we see this juxtaposition of tremendous Bonneville flood sediments overtopped by Missoula back flood sediments and is to me one of the most interesting and important outcrops of any of the probably hundreds that we've seen. And that is where I would like to just spend six months doing a master's thesis thesis on that particular outcrop and the story it has to tell. Yeah. Look yeah. how clean those uh, channel lines are. I know. It's, it, it's either very young or there's not very much erosion happening in that area. Well, since, since all of this landscape was created, the, the erosion has been minimal. Right. It's very arid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This so, is Dirk's Lake. Remember we took a, we went swimming in Dirk's Lake. Right. Yep. Oh, okay. So the falls are past that. Yeah. Okay, just yeah. past it. Right. All so, right. yeah, look at, you had the overland flow that, look, it's obviously coming back in. Look at these canyons here. Yeah. So you got this flow of water back into the constriction here. And so it flowed through here and became much more powerfully erosive. And so that's what created the falls. And, and there's another go. set of cataracts. Yeah, right there. I see them. Or I don't know. Maybe those are backflow features. Man, look those, those look like potholes. Circular potholes. Or right cutting. here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably what they are. Yeah. And here's the Perrine uh, Memorial Bridge. Right. Let's see if we can. Can you, wow, are you, that's, that's can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great place to get a perspective on the, on the canyon itself. Um, yeah. So I've been wanting to raft or canoe the snake. I look, it looks to me like a perfect river for, so maybe sounds, we could actually sounds good to me. come Let's up with a it. tour where we, one on one of the days we procure, uh, rafts or canoes somewhere and, and take a jaunt down the river. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'm in. Yeah, it's been 20 years since we were out there. We're overdue. Yeah, that's right. It's been that long already? Yeah, summer of 2000. Oh, man. Well, you know, Wilbur went on the first couple trips with us, so that's the early days. That was the early days, yep. All right. So I guess we'll stop there for yep. tonight. Time to wrap it up. That's been fascinating, man. Yeah. Wow. Well, we'll pick this up. We're moving into the channel scab lands, and that's going to segue into our keep our fingers crossed May tour of the tour. scab lands. Yeah. Some fingers of the most spectacular crossed. cataclysmic flood features on the planet. All right. Well, Brad? we'll have Jerome Lesman in a couple episodes to. Yep. Gear us up, getting back into that territory, looking at some more drumlin features. Uh, and then uh, about about this time, we're going to be making the big move to, to how to. So stick with us through that. There's going to be some bonus material, and uh, we're going to be pulling out shorter excerpts and uh, mm -hmm. many new things coming here as we, as we grow in advance here. But uh, stick with us. Yeah. All these maps are making it even better. Yeah, they sure That's are. Right. That's right. And um, we have a bunch of new emails for, uh, for RandallCarlson.com. Okay. Uh, right? Or we do. And we're still working on the best system. We think we're going to have a form developed Yeah, uh, that's right. through the website. And then people can like help categorize more specifically what their comment or question involves. And then uh, hopefully that is going to allow us to get to get to answer them or respond to them uh, more systematically and uh, timely because it's have been uh, yeah. some long ways for some people that have been interested and wanted to correspond with us. That's uh, right. Yeah. So yeah. One, of, one of the many fresh yeah. things we're working on and uh, we got our social media manager starting to operate and signing us up on all the, the different platforms. And uh, so we're having all kinds of different announcements and updates coming uh, about what we're up to. 
So That's we're right. grateful to have her on board with us. Yes, That's indeed. Right. So check out randallcarlson.com. That's where all the, the podcast related stuff is and Randall's work, the blog, a uh, bunch of new plans and big plans for that website as well, but it's already awesome. Uh, that's where the form will be. But until then, you can keep sending stuff to Cosmographia1618 at gmail.com. But soon, that's we'll right. have a better, a better place for you to go. So, all right, everybody. Thanks very much. Great show, guys. Thank Thanks guys. for joining us. Good yeah. to see you guys as always. You too. Yep. Likewise. Awesome stuff, Randall. Mike? I'll be reporting to you guys back about our meeting tomorrow. And at some point, we want to update our faithful listeners on some of the other plans that we've got brewing. That's right. In the Sounds pipeline. Good. Yep. All right. Good night, guys. Good night. All right, Joe.